So welcome, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming this afternoon for a conversation uh, with a writer and honorary degree candidate, Frank DeFord. That's candidate, candidate. not yet recipient. Oh. The, the, there's, I could blow it. Yeah, you know, the, the, the registrar was in touch. There's something about a physics exam that hasn't come in yet. Uh, I am, I'm Gage McQueenie. I'm a professor in the English department at Williams College, uh, where I specialize in Victorian literature. But more to the moment, I drew the golden ticket in getting to host this conversation with a writer whose work I grew up with um, that I admire greatly. Uh, so it turns out there's one perk anyway to being the chair of the Williams College Athletics Committee. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the only perk, uh, other than working with really great people. Uh, so Frank, Frank DeFord is the author of 18 books. I think that's right, yeah? 18 people. That's, that's approaching Charles Dickens' level productivity. <laughs> right? And if that weren't enough, he's a monthly commentator on NPR's Morning Edition, senior correspondent on the HBO show Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, and senior contributing writer at Sports Illustrated, where he began his career in 1962, straight out of uh, Princeton University, from which he graduated. He's been elected to the Hall of Fame of the National Association of Sportscasters and Sports Writers and voted U.S. Sports Writer of the Year six times. So GQ magazine called Frank DeFord, quote, the world's greatest sports writer. So if you, if you got a belt for that title, like the heavyweight <laughs> champ belt, uh, GQ, that'd be a good place to get it from. That would be a nice belt. Uh, but sports writer is just part of his writing profile. He's written nine novels and a nonfiction book about the Miss America pageant, as well as a book about his daughter, Alex, who suffered from cystic fibrosis. His most recent book is a memoir called Over Time, and I, re I really recommend it to you. Uh, Frank DeFord has received numerous awards for his print and broadcast journalism, including the National Magazine Award for Profiles, an Emmy, and a George Foster Peabody Award. In 2013, President Obama honored Frank DeFord with a National Humanities Medal for, quote, transforming how we think about sports. Two of his books, the novel Everybody's All American and Alex, A Life of a Child, his memoir about his daughter, have been made into, into movies or television. Sports Illustrated named Everybody's All-American one of its top 25 sports books of all time. And he is chairman emeritus of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, having served as its national chairman for 16 years. So it's worth underscoring that, that Frank DeFord is a rarity among writers. That is, most writers find their, their, their niche, uh, their genre, and they stick with it. So the poets stay out of the way of the novelists, and the novelists try not to poach on the playwright's turf. Uh, but Frank DeFord plays the field, that is, he ranges from sports journalism to novels to sports criticism, what I would call sports criticism, and the manner of literary criticism. Uh, for NPR, I think this is right, he has written over 1,600 weekly commentaries for NPR's Morning Edition. That is an amazing number. <laughs> uh, he's also written memoir, television, radio. So it's famously been said of another epically untiring and universally admired writer, Charles Dickens, that even the record of his conviviality is exhausting. So I promise, I won't keep doing this, like the Victorian novel stuff, but, but, but Frank's NPR column is called Sweetness and Light, and that is a reference to Victorian poet and critic Matthew Arnold. So I'm just doing my job here by bringing the Victorian stuff in. Okay, fortunately for us, the record of Frank DeFord's writing is lengthy, but anything but exhausting. It's just the beginning of our event this afternoon. Frank, welcome to Williams College. We're so glad to have you here, and thank you for taking part in this conversation. Um, I think the, the format here, what we'll do is I'll ask a few questions, we'll, we'll get things going, um, and then at some point I think we should open it up to the audience, uh, who I'm sure will have, will have questions as well. And I think we are scheduled, uh, we, we, we need to be out by 4.15 because I think people have other places to be. I know I have other places to take, to take you. So the first question that I wanted to ask, it, it, it was just interesting hearing you talk about uh, like being a fan and the relationship between being a sports fan and being a sports writer. And the question would go something like this, or maybe two parts, says, do you have to be a fan to be a sports writer? That's the first part. And then the second part is, can you be a fan and be a sports writer? I think you have to like sports if you're going to be a sports writer. 
I, I, by the same token, I think you have to like politics if you want yeah. to be a political writer. I think you'd be crazy to say be um, a religious writer if you had no interest in the spiritual life whatsoever. Um, having said that, then you have to divide yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not supposed to, to root the expression is no cheering in the press box. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you don't, as a human being, find yourself in favor of one team or the other. As a matter of fact, I think I've often thought, if you really are covering something and you don't <laughs> care for one team or one person more than the other, then you really aren't involved. I mean, it's impossible to be altogether ob objective. The trick then, though, is that when the, when the game is over, that you've got to write about it without showing, you know, your, your, your affection. But some things you can't lose. Like, I grew up in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an Oriole fan. I, I can't... Um, can't help that. And, and I remember one year I uh, had the, the perfect conflict because I had done stories during the year on the Chicago White Sox. And the White Sox ended up playing the Orioles in the American League Championships. And boy, talk about being torn. Yeah. Did you have to recuse yourself like a judge? Like, do you well, have to say I, 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 in, in effectively, yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember the Orioles did win rather conclusively. I was glad that it didn't come down to the last moment and so forth. So, but, but everybody has their favorites, and you just simply can't, can't avoid that, yeah. I don't yeah. think. So are there, are there people, there's maybe a different version of this, who do you love to watch? Like, who do you love to watch? And then who do you love to write about? And are okay. those the same? Are those the same people or teams? My favorite sport as a fan yeah. is, is baseball. Yeah. I, th I think that's the best game. Okay. I am totally baffled by the popularity of soccer in the rest of the world. Yeah. You're going, is that it's straight for the controversy. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's incomprehensible to me yeah. Yeah. that the favorite sport of human beings is one that we play with our feet. Yeah. And we do everything else with our hands. Mm. It makes oh. no sense to me whatsoever. Though I am quite aware of the fact that if I was had been born in Barcelona right. or Sao Paulo, I would be following those, you know, soccer players and right. uh, j just like all the the rest of the nuts in the world. Right. I, and yeah, that it that it that it really does depend on the the culture into which you're born. The oh, place I don't think there's any yeah. any any, yeah. any question about that. Yeah. And and uh, what do I love? I love I love. Quarterbacks, I'm fascinated mm -hmm. with them. You know, Why? Standing, uh, probably, again, this goes back to your youth. I yeah. mean, you always remember, it's like the songs. We remember the songs that, right. I knew I was old when the oldies but goodies were no longer the ones that I had grown up with. That's right. when I knew yeah. that I had passed yeah. on to a new <laughs> yeah. le level. And I grew up with Johnny Unitas. And mm -hmm. may, maybe it's as, as simple um, a, a, as that. Um, I don't like uh, violent sports, yeah. though. I, 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 re, I really don't. I can't stand automobile racing. Mm -hmm. um, I, love, um, I love horse racing. Mm. And again, I, 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 I grew up with that. So... Uh, the great ones who come and go uh, in any sport uh, attract me just, just because they're so good. Yeah. I think, I can remember talking to, to Boog Powell, the old Oriole, uh, who had been good enough to be most valuable player one year. And I said to him, I said, I simply don't understand 
how you hit a baseball thrown 95 yeah. miles an hour that darts and and he said, you know, and now he's an old man, and he said, I stand there before the game at batting practice, and I don't understand how I huh. ever did it. Huh. And, and, and I, we, you have, it's just amazing to me how good, good athletes are. This yeah. guy, Stephen Curry, is, is like an alien. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's true. That is, you, you, one gets the sense that he made a pact with the devil somewhere, yeah. right? And I he's mean, just shooting uh, yeah. shots. You're like, well, this is going to be a good life he, for you. He reminded me of Jerry West. Yeah. But then he's gone beyond that because yeah. he can shoot 10 feet further out. And I, it's so... Yeah. Yeah. So you were... So you are... One, one could imagine that after, after many years, after writing about just about everybody that you could want to write about, right? One of the great things, mm -hmm. you wrote for Sports Illustrated... You tell a great story in, uh, in, your, in your book and memoir about you know, just going down to interview, and they're happy to send you over to Sports Illustrated over there at Time, Inc., because it's the kind of like basement you know, sort of publication. They're surprised, essentially, anyone wants to work for Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Uh, but then it becomes this enormous magazine, right? A, a cultural phenomenon in its It own was right. helped by the swimsuit issue. That, that may have had something to do with it. Uh, but it's and it and it persists, right? It's still. I mean, it's it's going. It's 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 keeping it's keeping going. I mean, later maybe we can talk a little bit about how sports journalism has joined has changed. But the thing that's impressive or is, is amazing is actually you you maintain a sense of wonder that is about oh. around sports. It doesn't get old for you. You don't think, oh, Steph Curry, he thinks he's amazing. You really should have seen so and so. Yeah, that but, but, guy was but by the same token, Gage. You're not going to catch me watching the Memphis Grizzlies right. play the Houston Rockets in February. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, hardly anybody's getting caught watching I that mean, game uh, at this point. Yeah. I think the the older I've gotten, the longer I've been around, the more discerning I've gotten about mm. the events that I wanted to to to, to see. Um, I, I saved myself for the. You know, like the fifth and the sixth and the seventh games of right. a series, and then, uh, in the beginning, I'll, I'll just read about them. I mean, right. you, you, yeah. After a while, you do get jaded, mm -hmm. and, and and but I remember as a kid sports writer, listening to all the jaded old guys, and I said, I will never do that, I, and, right. I, and I can't stand guys saying, well, it was, you know, so much better back then. Right. And, and that's a, a, a tendency that we all have. Yeah. yeah, though the difference with sports writers is like, if you want to talk about Johnny Unitas, you can find people who will talk about that, who will be very happy to talk about, right, an, an old player. You want to talk about the 86 Mets, right, you can find some people to oh, talk yes. about, those, about those Mets. My daughter would be glad to come here. She wasn't alive then, but she'd be glad to talk about those Mets. That's interesting. Um, so, I uh, know, she was, cur she was, you know, her, 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 her grandmother made her a Mets fan, and I thought, what have we done to this child? This is terrible. And then last year happened, and I thought, well, she knew, she knew what she was doing. But, but for sports, right, you can talk about, um, yes. you know, athletes who, who, whose greatness, I mean, it's such a short time, right, for any athlete. How many years of greatness does any athlete really have in them? One might say oh, a great 10-year career, that's, that's long. A long. That's a time. long career. That's not much of a life, right? No. Like of a, of, a, of a lifespan. So it's no. always fading. It's always like out of, you know, you're just glimpsing it. And you, you, you've, you've talked a little bit about how hard it is to interview young players. Well, they, they, haven't, haven't, they, they haven't lived. lived. Yeah. And, and, and if they're any good at a young age, it means that they were always good. I mean, mm -hmm. from the minute, from four or five years old. And, and all they've had is success. Uh, they've just beaten everybody at that point. And so yeah, it isn't their fault. It, it yeah. really isn't. But I would much rather talk to the grizzled veteran, the right. managers. Those are the ones with, with, with good stories, because they've been failures, you know, right. and, and, and they've had hard times. And the, the worst thing you can do is, is, is 
try to make something out of these kids who are nothing right. but, you know, great athletes. Yeah. They're, they're just molecules that, that are put together the right way. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. so one has to find a way to write about just that, right? That is, it's not a great story, but it's a, it's a kind of, it's a way to convey and print uh, something that feels transcendent. Like when I watch a great player do something, I, I, I mean, I don't know why I watch sports. I have no idea, I cannot figure it out. You know, someone said to me, why do you care? It's not real. I'm like, well, you know, I like study yeah. literature. That's not real either. But it, uh, is. But it is real. But it right? is it's real, it's very real. In the same way the real. literature is incredibly consequential for me, yeah. sports feel consequential. Yeah, it is real. And, and as I say, it is the only one of the arts where the best is also the most popular. Mm. Right. There's no, like, the best indie, books indie are not the or, yeah, right. and so forth, yeah. uh, and and the best music, and sports is the one place where what you are, what most of us see and love, is the very best that there is, and I think that has a lot to do with with their charm. You really are a champion, yeah. and just because you have a number one record doesn't make you a champion. Right. Yeah, and there's and there's a pleasure in enjoying that with other people, right? That is, oh, and, yeah. uh, all right. My friends and I were just talking about Steph Curry now, uh, because he's such an amazing shooter and he's had these incredible performances. And there's a pleasure in everyone saying, "This guy is incredible." And, and you can see yeah. it. Yeah, it's uh, there. I mean, sports it's is pretty pretty obvious. Yeah. I mean, you don't you don't need an academic to explain yeah. to you. Right. You'll and, forgive me. Yeah, no, no, I'm happy to play that role, yeah. yeah. Why such and such is right. good. Right, it's like explaining a joke. If you have to explain it, yeah, it's it, not it, funny it, it anymore. Good joke. Right, likewise, soccer. No matter how much explaining someone can do, <laughs> right, can. you're never going to like soccer. Right? I, I, had, I didn't grow up playing soccer. My children, because they're children of today, they play soccer, and they play a lot of soccer. And so I, re and I, and I had to coach soccer. I was three years into coaching before my fellow coach. I was out subbing in on some little play. And I said, that was fun. And he said, well, you've played, right? He's like, nope. Yeah. And he said, wait, really? And I said, yeah, I don't know anything about soccer. He's like, OK, we need a new coach. But I, I, I had to learn to love it. But I had to do it through my kids, right? I had to filter it through them. I couldn't just sit down and watch a Real Madrid game and say, oh, that's beautiful. I had to really, really learn. Well, they are amazing work. what they can do with their yeah. feet. Uh, <laughs> I've bullied. I've but bullied I, think, I think it was yeah. Samuel Johnson who said that uh, a dog who could stand on its hind legs, it, it, you know, w w was also amazing. Not just that he could do it, but that he could do it well. And, and, yeah. and the same thing applies to soccer right. players. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In my mind. Um, are, there, are there people... Athletes that you've encountered, I mean, just sticking with your, your, your sports journalism for the, for the moment, are there athletes you've encountered through your, through your days who really surprised you? That is, someone that you thought was going to be not interesting or mean or something like that, and they turn out to be incredibly nice or gracious or interesting, or, or it could be the reverse. Usually you know ahead of time. Yeah. Because I, the reputation is gone Because they're so, they're so famous. Yeah. That you know, you'd, you'd really be surprised. The, the, yeah. the one example I can think of in my in my whole life was that I was doing a charity thing with, and they had three or four uh, athletes. And Ted Turner owned the um, Braves then, and he had sort of forced Hank Aaron mm -hmm. to uh, uh, go to this thing, yeah. and, and and so. We go back to the hotel in the same car, and I said good night, and he said, "Wouldn't you like a beer?" And I said, "Sure." And we sat and talked for yeah. for two hours, and he told me things that I had never heard before. I mean, that was that's the reason I can remember that is that it's so singular. Yeah, it well, it, it just doesn't happen, and, yeah. and because most and most athletes of that stature. 
they've got, they're tired of talking or they've got other stuff or they're on a tight schedule and, or you already know everything that there is to be known about them because they've already been interviewed yeah. many times. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, what is there to say? Now, we are going to have more written and said about Muhammad Ali yeah. in the next 24 hours or a week. And how much of that is going to be original right. is, is, is minuscule. Yeah. I mean, there is nothing more, I don't think, to learn about the man, particularly since his life more or less ended yeah. a long time ago, so that there's been nothing added to, to it. Uh, and, and that's true with athletes. At a certain point, there's just no there there. It just ends. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we should be surprised at that. But it's, it's, it's a fact of, of, of life. And, and the great thing about sports is that it's heroes and villains and drama and glamour and wins and losses. I mean, it has all that. But you can't make these guys into things that they're not. It's right. the game, really. Yeah, that it, the stage, if right. you will, that sets it that, up. That produces that. I mean, so, so Muhammad Ali, that f it feels like what will have to happen, or what does happen, is, since there's nothing really new to learn about Muhammad Ali. That no, is, the no, facts are there, no. right? That is, he lived in the public eye for yeah. his entire career, right? And was not a reticent speaker. Uh, was <laughs> right. That is, uh, you know. An, an, an easy interview in the sense of we'll always have something to say. So is that though like there like is this where we kind of get the sort of moment of what I might call like sports criticism or something that is a kind of like reevaluation of Muhammad Ali or of the historical moment or that 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 I, sort of thing? I can't imagine that he will be evaluated yeah. any differently now yeah. because as I said that. The record speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that he did, um, which was important and beyond the realm of sport, which was, was first of all, becoming a Muslim, yeah. and, and, and secondly, when he, he didn't get refused to accept yeah. the draft, those things have been you know, just beaten to death. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and yet we're going to feel an obligation in the press to to play them all up all right. all over again, yeah. and I, I just you yeah. know don't know what more is going to right. be what added to yeah. the Muhammad Ali. I mean, there's the that sense of the the way that his image has been softened, right over the years. Like well, Muhammad Ali is a he was a lovable guy in the last twenty years. That he was not so necessarily. That's He's divisive. interesting. Yeah, a that. So seldom does someone, particularly in sport, do this. Does their reputation change? Mm -hmm. If they come in and p people don't like them, yeah. they stay that way forever. The only other person I can think of besides Ali, who went from being generally hated, yeah. w w Ted Williams had that right. experience. You know that yeah. he became lo lovable in, in, in the end, and and, and Ali did. And the irony is there, as you suggested, that there was a lot of him that was not nice. Mm -hmm. You remember, I mean, he, he, um, he, he criticized uh, uh, other boxers, mm -hmm. made fun of them, mocked them. Yeah. Um, he was not altogether uh, you know, a, a, a sweet guy, and yet in the beginning, so many people disliked him, especially when he, when he became a Muslim. I mean, yeah. there, there was, <sighs> newspapers had to be told right. to, to use his right. name. Right, who would insist on calling him Cassius Clay. Cassius yeah. Clay, or, or and there uh, was a great uh, New York uh, columnist named Dick Young for the mm -hmm. Daily News, and he, it, he just it drove him crazy, and he called him Ali Baby. Mm -hmm. when he was told that he right. had the use. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yet he's a, he's a complicated man, and he's not... And, and another thing about Ali is he was portrayed, I think, as much smarter 
mm. than he really was. Um, what, what makes you say that? I just, my experience with yeah. him, I don't think that he was as bright and engaged mm. as the poets wanted to make him. I mean, mm-hmm. people like Norman yeah. Mailer held, yeah, right held him in, up. Right I mean, he was, and oh. um, some some poor guy like Joe Frazier w- right. was was painted as as this this dope. Who, who was up against this, this bright, street-smart guy. And I, I don't, just yeah. m- my, my time with Ali, he was, he was a, I was with, I remember one time I was with him, and I forget why, but suddenly we, we were in a hotel suite together, and there had been four or five other people there, and they all left. And the two of us are sitting there, and, and there was a piano in the suite. And he walks over to the piano and starts playing the Tennessee Waltz. And I'm thinking, where in where, the yeah. world did that come from? Yeah. And uh, he, <laughs> the first time I met him um, was when he went to testify, or, or was sent to testify in Albany about a bill they wanted to ban boxing in New right. York. Yeah. And um, if you heard him there, for example, you, you would have realized that, that he was not as smart as, mm-hmm. as he was painted. But I rode back on a train with him, and you know he can't, couldn't stand to be alone. And even though I was this absolute young reporter, uh, he cornered me, and he started talking he was obviously going through uh, this this religious transformation yeah. in his mind, yeah. and he was drawing all kinds of things about stars and stuff. Oh, I wish I'd saved those yeah. Yeah. things, and 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 I didn't. And I mean, he just you 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 never you never knew with, with him. Uh, mm. I, yeah. I, I I and then he, then he he got sad. He he would do a thing. We were having dinner one night, my wife and I and a couple other people and, and Ali, and he went to sleep on her shoulder at, 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 in, in, in a restaurant, and he just went to sleep on Carol's shoulder. But you never, and then he would all of a sudden wake up or pretend to wake up. You never knew right. whether. Or pretend to sleep, yeah. Who, the yeah. last 15, 20 years of his life that he talked, he told two jokes over right. and over again. Yeah. Yeah. One of them was anti-Semitic, and the other one was kind of a race joke. Yeah. And he just would tell the same yeah. jokes and over and over. That, those last years of his, of his life, which are really the ones, you know, yeah. for me as an adult to, to watch, you know, the ravages of, of that career. And then he, he lit the torch in the 96 oh, Olympics. Oh, that was, yeah. And it was beautiful, but you could see... He could yeah, barely do it. Sh- yeah, shake, yeah. shake all, so, all the time. Yeah, it's one. I mean, one of the things that it, it seems is, to me that sports writing can do really well, and that you do ex- exceptionally well, is there's a tendency to produce these kinds of stories, right? They're sort of like set pieces. Here's the hero. Here's the villain. And then there's other more interesting things going on. Like that's fun, right? That is interesting. That's part of the pleasure of sports. I will never cross. I will never like if I see Reggie Miller. I'm a, I was a Knicks fan. So if I see Reggie Miller walking down the street, I will cross the street to get away from Reggie Miller. <laughs> because I know he's a nice guy. I've been told. He's a nice guy, but he just you. he destroyed me. He destroyed my, you know, my, my, my basketball team. So, the, and I love having him as a villain. That, um, that feels fun. But of course, there's, there are much more nuanced stories to tell. Right? There, are, there are things that you can get to beyond the hero and villain story. The, the, the sweetest... Uh, episode I ever had with, with Mohammed, and this goes directly to what we were talking about earlier, about how his reputation changed. So um, this was about probably about 15 years ago, and we were in, in Washington, and uh, Neil Leifer, uh, the great sports photographer, uh, who's photographed Ali in, including that famous one where he beats Liston and is like that. Yeah. And, and Leifer had this idea to photograph Ali 
at the Vietnam Memorial. And now, apart from Jane Fonda, who was more identified with, you know, being pro North Vietnamese and, and being a traitor and so forth than Ali. And I thought, uh oh, boy, this is not a good idea. But we went out there to the to, to the to the monument and, and all of the people who were there, you've got to assume that they were there because they were looking for the names mm. of their loved ones, their former husbands or sons or, 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 or whatever. I mean, and, and they're all tracing like this, and, and he's posing in front of the, of, the, of the monument. And all of a sudden, they spotted him. And I thought, oh, my God, well, this is going to be awful. And you know, they ran to him and em, 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 embraced him handed me their cameras and asked me to please take a picture. I mean, yeah. That really yeah. showed how the attitude toward him had shifted. Yeah. And maybe some of that had to do with the fact that he was already uh, falling apart physically yeah. and that yeah. there was a sympathy for him, which was certainly uh, yeah. d deserved. Yeah. Um, and 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 maybe even shifting attitudes toward that toward that war as, and, as well. And, yeah, right? that's that, the, is, that, 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 that would, may the, well be. If if you the best book about Ali is called The Ghost of Manila hmm. by the late Mark Cram, uh, and it's about Ali and Fraser, and and it it. It never became a success because it was critical of Ali, mm -hmm. and and you weren't supposed you to weren't be supposed critical to be of Ali. Yeah. But it, but it, I recommend that for anybody who wants to read a fair account of of him, The Ghost of Manila by Mark Cram. Okay, thank you. Oh. So can we can we we're we're here. We're at Williams. We're on a college campus. Uh, we're on a Division three sports college campus. Uh, can, can we talk a little bit about college sports? Sure. Uh, your sense of maybe how things have changed in college sports during your, during your career? Um, your sense that is of like maybe some about how people write about it or how it's covered or just what's, what's, what's changed about college sports? Well, of course, you, the you main thing that's changed this. about college sports and all sports is that women have come into it. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I started in, uh, as a writer in the 1960s, um, women's sports barely existed um, and was, there was almost no coverage of it right. wh whatsoever. And uh, Title IX just, just changed everything. I think there are now more girls who play school sports than boys. Mm -hmm. It's it's certainly equal, and, and if it wasn't for football, and football has no, is the one sport that has no female analog, right. um, it would be even more yeah. uh, uh, women playing than men. It just it changed the whole attitude. So yeah. that's simple, and and, and I don't think there's any argument. The other thing about college sports that's changed, of course, is the money. Yeah. Uh, the extraordinary amount of money that, that came in. Uh, um, and, and hand in glove with that, of course, is television. J Johnny Wooden mm -hmm. is probably the recognized as the greatest you know, college coach of the 20th century, or certainly one of them. And, the most he ever made coaching UCLA was forty-two thousand dollars a year. Now, maybe yeah. in today's, you know, if you translate that to today, it would be one hundred and fifty or yeah. eight hundred and eighty. That's like 000. what Jim Harbaugh is getting at yeah. University of Michigan, right? and he didn't yeah. get any money from Nike either right. or anything yeah. like that. So that when athletes um, were playing for coaches who were making that that kind of money. I think it was justified that, okay, they're uh, not going to get paid. Yeah. But now, when you've got coaches making literally ten million dollars, how many what is that? How many figures is that? Seven, eight figures. Yeah, eight figures. Um, 
then it, it becomes impossible, to my mind, to justify that the players are, are, are not sharing in, in the pie. And, it, and what, really what I'm talking about here are, are, are football and basketball. Right, marquee sports. I mean, yeah, I don't television think sports. there's any reason why, uh, uh, you know, a volleyball player should, should be making, a college volleyball mm-hmm. player should be making money. But, 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 but football and basketball players should be paid in, in, in kind. I mean, I, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. That's what we're, we're talking about. I also think it's, it's, it's a sham, as we all know, um, about keeping athletes eligible. I mean, they're not getting an education. They're just being kept eligible. And we, we've seen it over and over again, even at great public universities like the University of North Carolina. And, and you know very well that if they're cheating at North Carolina, they're cheating at a lot mm-hmm. of other places too. Mm-hmm. And um, you can't, football is too much part of, of the culture. It, it, in, in many respects, we've, we've, we've been poetic through the years about baseball coming at the beginning of spring and, the, and fathers and sons. But, but football really, in a way, goes deeper into our culture because it's high school football and college football. Baseball has never made its mark there. Mm-hmm. And you have homecoming in which yeah. you go back. You don't go back. You don't go back to your college. You go back to, your, to see a football game. Right. I mean, it, it's it's just so deeply embedded in us that I uh, it's going to be very tricky in the in the years ahead because of the concussions yeah. as 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 to how colleges and high schools can drop football, which they're going to you know eventually have to do, mm-hmm. I think. But it sounds like you're you're skeptical about the capacity to do that because it is so deeply ingrained deeply that there's embedded. going to be a lot of resistance so, to that. Uh, I mean, like the Ivy League has made a rule that you can't have any contact in practice, right. which is nonsense. I mean, that's like saying, well, we, you can't practice hitting in baseball. Right. I mean, if, 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 you've, if you've reached that point, you're deceiving yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's obviously just a step. Why? Why do you have a football team here? Mm-hmm. Why? Why do you risk the brains of very bright young men? Mm-hmm. To you know, I'd rather see him play soccer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and actually, the, the second, apparently, the second. Worst yeah. sport for concussions is women's soccer. It's women's soccer. soccer. Yeah, so, no, I mean, it's really bad. Yeah, nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing is, is, you can't avoid it. Right, but, yeah. Um, but as far as big-time college uh, football and, and, and basketball, yes, I think they should be paid. Yes, I, I don't think that if they want to go to class, they can. If they don't want to go to class... They don't have to. They get four years, do whatever they want to. Hmm. In effect, you know, major in football. Right. Yeah. So that, that will fundamentally change how football looks and feels on college campuses if they are employees of the, of the, of the college. Well, they all, we already accept yeah. it. We know they're employees. Yeah. And, and, and we know that they don't um, uh, stop playing football when the season ends. They continue to work in the weight room and then they yeah. have spring training and they're supposed to do this. And, and everybody understands um, that they are paid performers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's no secret. And by the way, <clears throat> college football and basketball are the only sports in the world where great money is made and the athletes don't get paid. It used to be 
that all kinds of, of athletes, swimmers, tennis players, and so forth, track and field, right. am- were amateurs. And were, but that's all f- faded away. It, only in the United States of America, college football and basketball players are the only, only athletes who, who play in, in where money is made and they don't get paid. I mean, it's, it's just not fair. That's all. It's just, it just comes down to a, 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 that, in my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. In a place like Williams, obviously, this is Division Three. There are, yeah. we, have great, we have great athletics here. It's a big part of the school. Something like 40% of our students play, play a sport. I mean, we, that's, the, that's the apocryphal version of this is that we have as many varsity athletes at Williams as yeah. the University of Michigan has, yeah. right? We, because we field all the same, yeah. fielded all the same teams. I'm sure that can't quite be true. Uh, but, so there's not money being made, but it is the case. I mean, it, it's, it's, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Like, it does feel, I, f- I even see with our, my, our student athletes here, that it's, there's a lot of out of season work that's going on, right? Off season oh, work. Yeah. Right? So that, the idea that you would play two sports, that seems to be fading. That's even gone, at, yeah, even the, 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 the old three sport yeah. athlete. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but the defense of amateurism um, falls apart because um, why aren't writers, for example, or musicians expected to be amateurs? They love playing music. Yeah. I love writing, but I wanted to make money at it and, yeah. and expected to. And so why should athletes alone, are they supposed to be amateurs? I don't know if you know the history of amateurism, but it, it developed in, the, uh, in England, uh, where so many of our sports did. Uh, it developed in the latter part of the 19th century when sports became important for the first time, and the upper classes wanted to keep the working classes out of the games so that they could play them. So if you said that you couldn't make any money, that immediately eliminated right. an awful lot of people who had to work for a living. Actually, the, the original definition of amateur was somebody who didn't work with his hands, mm. you know, yeah. didn't, didn't, didn't labor. Um, so it, it, it just, there's no justification for it. It's not... It, it's not American to, to be you know, sappy. Yeah. It, it, it isn't. Yeah. You are never afraid to express your your thoughts. You do you and these three minute NPR things that you do. It's what's part of what's so impressive is how you have to establish a hook early. You can't you can't walk people in slowly. You have to have you have no to three take minutes. A, take yeah, you have yeah, to. Yeah, you're gonna in. really get in there. So. Yeah, but, We've, Both guns blazing, yeah. Yeah, no, it's very no, it's true. That's a big difference between the long form stuff, yes, right, and the three minutes. Entirely stuff. different. Yeah, but we we've got about a little under fifteen minutes left, so maybe we should we should see if there are people in the audience. Oh yeah, there are people there are people in the audience who have, who have questions. Okay, so let's start right here in the in the front row, and if you could, it's a small room, but maybe yeah, if you could stand up and, and speak in a clear voice. Uh, I want to ask you about your opinion of SP on ESPN, and before I do, I want to tell you what my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> they elevate uh, gambling to a competitive sport with rivalries. They uh, sensationalize issues like Deflate Gate. They have talking heads fighting for airtime, breaking down uh, every contest imaginable. They have utter control of football, professional football, college football financially. Scheduling, they have control uh, over uh, college basketball, the, pl- the playoffs. That's where the money is coming from uh, that you, you were talk- talking about. I think ESPN has a pernicious influence on teenagers in this country. The highlights that they show in basketball are all dunks, fancy things, very little team play. Do you have a comment? <laughs> um. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, the Deflategate thing, as a Giants fan, that's real. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they've suffered, ESPN has suffered yeah, some financial yeah. uh, difficulties recently, um, w- which is 
uh, a change from the past when they were just printing money. I mean, everybody I, or most everybody here, I'm sure, has cable TV, and you are paying, I think it's like $5 a month for, for ESPN, and the next channel down the list is like 37 cents. I yeah. mean, it, I'm making those figures up, but that, that's it. Uh, um, ESPN is really, I mean, I, dis, I don't disagree with anything that you say, except it's, it's, it's filled the void. In other words, if there wasn't an ESPN, there would be something else. And that's why Fox and NBC and CBS and all the others are trying to start sports channels too, because it, it's, it's, it's so attractive. I mean, there's, this, there's a simple reason for that. We can watch something that we love on television, even if it's Downton Abbey, we can say, well, we'll watch it Tuesday night. But you got to watch sports live. And that makes all the difference in, in the world, in, in the media world today. It's and the one thing that you got to watch live. Well, maybe Donald Trump found out that, that Debates were, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and charged for it, but but essentially, that that's it. And, and, and ESPN, and keep in mind too, ESPN, you are not their audience. Their audience, as you said, is kids. Yeah. And there's constant news. Yeah. There's always news. It, always. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here in the front row. So one of the, one of the things I like most about you is your ability to talk about the personalities of the people. I'm from Minnesota. But you're talking to primarily a New England audience, and you mentioned villains and heroes. Yeah. What are your opinion of Bill Belichick and Tom Brady? <laughs> uh, it, Belichick has always been shady. I mean, you know, he's always just, he's, he's always just kind of wa walked, walked the line. He's always been, and a couple times he, he has been caught. Um, the other side of the coin is he's obviously a brilliant coach. He's obviously, he's amazing the way he seems to know when to get rid of players and, and when to pick up players who nobody else uh, could see the value in them. So that, that part is, is just indisputable that he's, he's the top of the tree. Um, Brady, I mean, is, a, is an extraordinary quarterback, and we won't dispute that either. I don't see how those balls <laughs> could have been changed without his recognition. I just don't see it. I mean, and I'm, I'm, you know. It's the piercing blue eyes. Yeah, so I mean, to, yeah. I don't know how they were changed. The guy goes into the men's room and all this stuff. And, 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 but there's no way that some little, you know, spear carrier is going to take the air out of balls unless Tom Brady has told him to or gotten the word to him to. So I'm sorry, but you know, that's, he's, he's, and also I would say he's very good looking. Yes. <laughs> I agree. Uh, yeah, that, that, that alone could do it. To, yeah, uh, to, that's, yeah, that's. To, 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 to. So right, right here in the, uh, so I yeah. I just want to say I'm so happy to see you in person and hear you. I listen to Morning Edition and I would drive to the office and wait for you to finish at <laughs> two minutes of, two seconds of nine and run into my office at nine o'clock. <laughs> so I couldn't leave you. I would be just riveted to NPR and couldn't wait to hear what you had to say. So you certainly do have the hookers in there. Well, thank you yeah, very much. Um, so many people hear me when they're brushing their teeth or otherwise <laughs> performing their morning ablutions and stuff. And, and, uh, it's, I, it's an intimate thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I was at a uh, college, which will, 
a New England, New England college, which will go unmentioned, but um, I was going to give a speech and at the reception ahead of time, um, the president of the college came in, a very vivacious and uh, attractive and also loud lady, and ac across the room she said, oh, Frank, this is the first time I've ever heard you with my clothes on. <laughs> so I know I'm it's speaking a to a lot of naked people yeah. in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very good line. Um, probably a little bit more, a little bit more time. Sure, right here in the plaid shirt. Um, three of your favorite sports writers and tell us in each case, what makes that, what draws that person, the journalist? The, the, three, the, the three, three favorite sports writers, and then what, 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 what makes you like them? What, what oh, draws you mean your attention now? as a journalist? Yeah, small things. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I elude that question, evade that question, because I don't know all the sports writers. It's so hard now. You know, you used to know that Jim Murray wrote for the Los Angeles Times and Red Smith for the New York Herald Tribune and so forth and so on. And, and you could pretty much say, these are my favorites. But there are sports writers out there that, you know, writing blogs yeah. or, or somewhere on the Internet that I just don't, don't know about. And I'm just scared to... To, to, to say that, I think um, the one I think is the best right now is, is Tom Verducci, who writes baseball for Sports Illustrated, because he's amazing. He, he knows the game so well, and yet he's also such a good writer. I just used that as, a, as, as an example. And, and um, sports writing has always been the best and the worst. It always had hacks, you know, people who just wanted to be in sports one way or another. And, and, and so they couldn't write, but they could, you know, get into the game that way. And, 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 but it also, because of the wonderful elements in sport, the dramatic, it, it, it lends itself uh, to, to good writing. And, I never, met, I never set out to be a sports writer, but once I got into it, 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 it was hard to leave because I thought, you know, anywhere else is going to be a lot harder. <laughs> uh, but, but it's a choice I'm glad, you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad that I was a troubadour for sports all, all these years because I do, I do think um, that it's an import, sports are important, that there are, in every culture, in all through the world, and, and they're, they're short of eating and drinking and procreation, but they're certainly on the same level as, as all of the arts, as religion, that, that's, they're that important in our lives, and, and, and they deserve to have Good media, good writing. I think we'll, we'll have time for, I think, just one more, but then I'm sure maybe we, we might have a few minutes after if you care to stick around, if we can do that. Um, so why don't you go ahead right here. So you touch a little bit on the blogs and the internet, uh, but how has sports writing changed, especially recently, with so much of the content moving online? Well, the the, the worst thing about online is that there's so little editing. And that applies, you know, f to all subjects. It, it isn't so much that sports writing has changed, it's, it's that journalism has, has changed. I mean, the internet is just probably the most important thing since, since Gutenberg. And, 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 um, But to be specific about sports, um, the, I think there's too much expertise in the writing now. Everything is numbers. Numbers just overwhelms everything else. Uh, and I think that's a shame, because that takes uh, not only some of the fun, 
but it takes some of the glamour and, and just the joy out of sports when all of a sudden it's, it's, it's mathematical to, you know, algorithms, whatever they are. And um, that, that's been the, the, the real change. Less editing, less... Uh, and, and, and style has been replaced by mathematics. Mm. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a shame. On the other hand, I know that it is a much more respected profession than it used to be. I think there are probably more good sports writers now than there ever were before, which is another reason I'm afraid to answer that, that, that question. It's, it's not, it, it used to be that, you know, we were looked upon as, as, as hacks and, and, and now we have a much better reputation than we ever did before. So more narrative, less quantitative, right? but the good news yeah. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you, that going into sports writing is a, is a respectable thing it, to it, do it's, now. It's much more Unlike, respectable, yeah. 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 It used to be sort of like, you know, my daughter's a freelance model, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 And it, we were down in that uh, a sports writer, and, 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 you know, so we are... Uh, um, we've, we've, we, I, th I do think we've arrived and that people treat it seriously now. Right. So parents of the class of 2016, or actually class of 2016, you can tell your parents you're going to be a sports writer now. That's okay. <laughs> That's right. right. The trouble is you can't get a job. Can't get a job. <laughs> yeah. That, sounds, that seems like a good place to end for graduation. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you.